the hour is dark. The night sky witnesses the terror and darkness of Gethsemane. The darkness Jesus sensed is more sinister than the blackness of the night. Jesus, deeply distressed and troubled, was overwhelmed with sorrow even to the point of death. Jesus knew that this new morning only ushered in the day of his death. He knew this was the day and the hour that he was being given to the darkness of this world. Jesus knew that he would be delivered into the hands of sinful men. This was the hour of darkness and death. The Sanhedrin, at the suggestion of the high priest, determined to kill Jesus. In the early hours of Friday, April 3rd of 33 AD, Judas bargained for the life of Jesus and entered into an agreement with the priests to act as his betrayer. Initially, the priests decided to postpone the execution until after the Passover season. But the offer of Judas changed everything. The agreed upon blood price between the priests and Judas was for 30 pieces of silver, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah that the price for the Messiah would be 30 pieces of silver. The Sanhedrin organized the temple police and part of a cohort of Roman soldiers. Their mission? To arrest the Christ. No doubt the Sanhedrin feared a riot among the people. Therefore the leaders planned to arrest, try and execute Christ secretly. This was the motive behind such a large company of soldiers sent to arrest one man. According to Matthew, a large crowd approached the garden, and Christ went out to meet them and inquired, Whom seek ye? And they replied, Jesus of Nazareth. John noted that when Christ identified himself, the soldiers drew back and fell to the ground. It's unclear whether the soldiers fell because Christ exerted power over them, or whether they fell out of respect for his royal person. It really doesn't matter in either case. Christ displayed his power over this situation. The Romans or the Jews could not take the life of Jesus. He gave it freely. The most powerful empire in the known world at that time was humbled before Jesus, and voluntarily or involuntarily, those who represented Rome were bowing before the Lord. At this point in the arrest of Jesus, he interceded for his disciples by saying, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. Judas, who had arranged an identifying sign with the soldiers, approached Jesus and said, The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Christ did not address Judas as an enemy, but rather as a friend, saying, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they, and laid hands on Jesus, and took him. During the Last Supper, Peter vowed that Jesus would not die. Without doubt, Peter expected to lay down his life for Jesus that night. So he attacked Malchus, the servant of the high priest, and cut off his right ear. Luke noted that Jesus healed the ear of Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into thy sheath. The cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? Matthew records that Jesus said, do you think I cannot call on my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Jesus wanted Peter to understand 
that should his goal be deliverance from arrest and death, he could summon the powers of heaven and not depend on impotent man. Then Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. When it became evident that Jesus would not resist arrest, then all the disciples deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Church history implies that this person was John Mark, author of the Gospel of Mark. This stands to reason, since he is the only Gospel writer to recall this event. When Christ's disciples fled, his prophetic words were fulfilled. But a time is coming, has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own house. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. Temple guards and the Roman cohort arrested Jesus and led him away to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed the crowd from a great distance. After his arrest, Jesus was brought to Annas first, for he was father to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. It was probably the assignment of Annas to determine what course the leaders would follow. This is the same Annas who saw Jesus disrupt his bazaar in the temple. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teachings. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. It is interesting to note that John referred to Annas as the high priest, and he referred to Caiaphas as the high priest. Who was the real high priest? History records the fact that Annas was appointed by Quinarius, procreator of Syria, but was removed from office seven years later by Valerius Gratus, procreator of Judea. According to the Bible, Caiaphas was the son-in-law of Annas. History indicates that the Romans in place of Annas appointed Caiaphas. Therefore, in regards to political matters, Caiaphas was the high priest to the Romans, while Annas was the unofficial high priest in regards to spiritual matters. In answer to our question, both men were recognized as high priests. Annas questioned Jesus on two counts. First, as to his disciples, and second as to his doctrine. He desired to find out how extensive the following of Jesus had become. Annas wanted to acquire information that the Sanhedrin could use before Pilate. The plan was to accuse Jesus of being a leader of a revolutionary band. It was obvious that at least two members of the Sanhedrin were infected by the doctrine of Christ, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. It is obvious that Jesus realized that this complete proceeding was illegal, both as to time and place. To this form of questioning, Jesus remained silent. When Annas realized that he couldn't acquire any information concerning his disciples, he turned his questions to Christ's doctrine. Jesus' response to Annas' questions implied that he realized that Annas' proceedings were illegal since he attempted to have Christ implicate himself. Because the answer of Jesus silenced Annas, one of his servants struck Jesus with the palm of his hand. This act of violence and Jesus' answer ended Annas' examination 
and Jesus was sent to Caiaphas, the high priest. It is also obvious that Jesus defeated this illegal examination. Annas recommended that they proceed with the trial and remanded Christ to the authority of Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin for further judgment and sentence. Jesus was taken from the house of Annas to the house of Caiaphas, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. According to the Mishnah, the Jewish oral tradition, such a meeting of the Sanhedrin during the night was illegal. The Sanhedrin was quickly called together to conduct this trial, and they had no opportunity to prepare their witnesses. Thus, though many false witnesses were paid to testify, their testimony bore no weight, for two witnesses did not support the charge. According to Mosaic law, two witnesses were needed to convict a man and impose the death sentence. The only statement that could be supported by two false witnesses was that Christ said, I will destroy this man-made temple, and in three days I will build another, not made by man. It's obvious that the two false witnesses were misquoting the statement of Jesus, given nearly three years prior after the first cleansing of the temple. In desperation, the high priest stood up in the midst of the trial and said, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? Since witnesses did not support the accusations, they were illegal. Therefore, Christ remained silent and refused to incriminate himself. When Christ would not respond to the false testimony, the high priest put Christ under an oath, saying, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ the Son of God. In response to the oath of the high priest, Jesus said, Yes, it is as you say. But I say to all of you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. On hearing this, Caiaphas tore his clothes an act specifically forbidden to a priest in the law of Moses, and cried out, He has blasphemed! Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you've heard the blasphemy! What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. The Sanhedrin made their judgment, and their judgment was death. The disciples were forewarned of the dangers they faced. Christ had exhorted them, Pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. Christ specifically warned Peter of his forthcoming denial. Peter and John followed Jesus and the mob for a short distance. John was known to the high priest, probably because of his family, and he was able to acquire access for Peter into the palace court. Fear has a unique way of expressing itself. People react differently. A simple servant girl can cause you to stumble. While Peter was in the palace court, the prediction of his denial came true. As Peter stood at the door of the palace, the servant girl said, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? And Peter said, I am not. Peter was warming himself by the palace courtyard fire when the servant girl approached him again and announced to those standing around, This is one of them. And Peter once again denied Jesus with an oath, saying, I am not. Shortly after the servant girl made her announcement, a servant to the high priest, being a kinsman to Marcus, whose ear Peter cut off, said, did not I see thee in the garden with him? Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. When Peter was confronted with the charges of attempted murder and being identified by one who saw him in the garden, Peter began to curse and swear, saying, I know not this man of whom you speak. 
Peter invoked the anathema curse to convince his accusers that he was not lying. The anathema curse is the most serious of all oaths because it calls for divine judgment and destruction should the oath not be true. Luke noted that when Peter denied Jesus the third time, the cock crowed and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Now he remembered the prediction of Jesus that before the cock crowed, he would deny him three times. At this point, Peter went out and wept bitterly. According to Hebrew and Roman custom, the crowing of the cock was considered the beginning of the third watch of the night, around three o'clock in the morning. In order to give a legal sanction to their notorious illegal proceedings, the elders of the people were assembled immediately at the dawn of day. Both the Sadducees, the chief priests, and the Pharisaic scribes were assembled in order to sanction the death sentence of the previous meeting. In the presence of the Sanhedrin, Christ was asked, If you are the Christ, tell us! Jesus replied to the injustice of their whole proceeding by saying, If I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. In Jesus' reply, the council recognized his reference to Psalms 110, that is a messianic psalm. His quotation of this psalm was Jesus' claim to messiahship. When Christ claimed to be the Son of Man, the council also understood the reference to Daniel chapter 7 as a messianic title. At this point, the Sanhedrin questioned Christ directly and asked, Are you then the Son of God? And he replied, You are right in saying, I am. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. In the estimation of the council, Christ was guilty of the sin of blasphemy that according to the Levitical law was a capital crime punishable by death. The Bible alludes to the possibility that there were two dissenting votes, that of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Thus, the trial before the religious authorities was terminated and they sentenced Jesus to death. When Judas saw the course of events, he was seized with remorse. He sought to extricate himself from involvement and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. He confessed, I have sinned, for I have betrayed innocent blood. The priests and the elders refused to assume the responsibility themselves, but placed it on him. Judas left the money as an offering for the temple. According to church tradition, Judas ran to the far side of the valley of Hinnon, tied his girdle around his neck, fastened it to a large limb that protruded off of the jagged cliff and hanged himself. According to Peter's testimony, Judas then fell headlong, bursting asunder in the mist and all of his bowels gushing out. Since it was unlawful to put blood money into the temple treasury, the priests used it to purchase a potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. This was done in fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah and Jeremiah. The Jews could not execute a person legally for Rome retained that authority. In order to carry out the sentence, the Sanhedrin had to obtain the approval of the Roman authorities. To get permission, the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. This is the same Pilate who authorized the Jews to proceed against Jesus when he ordered a large cohort 
of Roman soldiers to aid in the arrest the evening before. John indicates that the Jews brought Jesus to Pilate in the early morning hour, somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Since the Jews did not want to incur ceremonial defilement, they refused to enter the palace. Therefore Pilate went out and asked them, What charges are you bringing against this man? The answer of the Sanhedrin was evasive. If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. The Sanhedrin realized that the crime of blasphemy was insufficient grounds in the eyes of the Romans to execute a man. They wanted Pilate to rubber stamp their charges without investigating them. Pilate, in response to the Jews' vague charges, refused to hear the case. Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews therefore said to Pilate, But we have no right to execute anyone. In response to Pilate's attitude, the Jews made three accusations against Christ. Any one charge could command the death sentence. The first charge was sedition. The second charge was refusing to pay tribute to Caesar and the third charge was claiming to be the Messiah, a king in opposition to Caesar. With these charges, Pilate took Jesus into the judgment hall and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? In response, Christ asked Pilate, Is that your own idea, or did others talk to you about me? Christ asked Pilate, whether the Jews accused him of treason or Rome. Charge of treason brought up the question of Christ's person and his kingdom. Jesus replied to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus stressed to Pilate that his kingdom would not be established as a worldly kingdom. Therefore Pilate stated, You are a king then. To which Jesus replied, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. When Pilate finished his examination of Jesus, he concluded that he was no threat to Rome. Pilate informed the priests that he could find no basis for a charge against him. Therefore, Pilate dismissed the charge of treason. The first trial ended with all charges against Jesus being dismissed. When Pilate heard that Jesus came from Galilee, he grasped an opportunity to remove himself from this case and sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Herod was excited to meet Jesus because he had heard many stories concerning Jesus and hoped he would perform some manifestation of magic to entertain him. Jesus remained silent before Herod and refused to answer the many questions Herod put to him Therefore Herod and his soldiers mocked Jesus and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. In sending Jesus back to Pilate, Herod reaffirmed Pilate's original declaration of innocence. Thus Christ a second time was declared innocent by the Roman authorities. When Herod refused jurisdiction and returned Jesus to Pilate, the latter summoned the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence, and I found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore I will punish him, and then release him. 
This was the third declaration of Christ's innocence. It would be a gross perversion of Roman law for Pilate to sentence Jesus to death or even to scourging. Pilate said, But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews or Barabbas? The people that gathered cried several times for the release of Barabbas. It was now apparent to Pilate why the Jews wanted Jesus executed, and therefore he sought to release Jesus. Pilate knew that the Jews handed Jesus over out of envy. Pilate was also anxious about this situation because his wife warned him to avoid this Jewish plot since she suffered many things in a dream because of Jesus. According to her testimony, she realized that Jesus was a just man who was innocent and holy. At this point, the people demanded the release of Barabbas, but this man was condemned for insurrection and murder. When Pilate realized that the people did not want Jesus released, he ordered him flogged in hopes of placating the people. Jesus, no doubt, received the traditional 40 stripes save one. In addition, the soldiers mocked Jesus by putting a crown of thorns on his head and they put on him a purple robe. The soldiers said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him with their hands. According to Roman custom, this flogging would be performed on the platform where the trial had been held, and in the eyes of all. Thus beaten and mocked, Pilate paraded Jesus before the assembled multitude and made a fourth declaration of Christ's innocence, saying, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. Then Jesus came forth, wearing a crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw Jesus beaten and bleeding, instead of being moved with pity, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. Pilate's answer, was the fifth declaration that Jesus was innocent. The Jews sought to support their claim that Jesus was worthy of death by saying, We have a law, and according to law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. This statement frightened Pilate. He feared the censure of Rome, but he feared the censure of a deity even more. Once again, he left the crowd and interrogated Jesus concerning this new charge. Pilate asked Christ, Where did you come from? Pilate was asking Jesus whether or not he was a god. Jesus did not answer Pilate's question. In frustration, Pilate said to Jesus, Do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize I have the power to either free you or crucify you? Jesus replied to Pilate, saying, You would have no power over me if it were not given you from above. Therefore, the one who hands me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. The reply proved to Pilate that Jesus was completely aware of his condition, but he would not stop it. Pilate sought to release Jesus, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be king opposes Caesar. It was obvious to Pilate that should he release Jesus, the Jews would accuse him of treason to Caesar. Should Pilate be so accused, he could be removed from office have his property confiscated 
and even put to death for siding with one who was charged with revolt against Tiberius. This would not be the first time Pilate would have to defend himself before Tiberius based on Jewish complaint. Pilate was known to disregard Jewish attitude toward images and idols by placing around Jerusalem incense of the emperor's effigy. On one occasion, Pilate attacked a company of Galileans in the temple court and mingled their blood with the blood of their sacrifices. Several incidents like these caused the Jews to file a complaint with Caesar Tiberius that resulted in Pilate being recalled back to Rome and severely rebuked by Caesar. At this point, Jesus was brought before the people and Pilate said, Behold your king. But the chief priests yelled, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! And therefore Pilate said, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. It is sad to note that the king the Jews claimed was the king who ordered their destruction on August 30th of 70 AD. When Pilate saw that he could not change the minds of the mob, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. According to Roman, Jewish, and Greek custom, when a man shed blood, he would wash his hands, thus symbolically cleansing away the stain. It is obvious Pilate felt that he was a murderer. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. Imagine being tried for the same capital offense on five different occasions and being exonerated at all five hearings, then being executed anyway. Jesus surrendered his right to a fair trial at Gethsemane. When he embraced his Father's will, Jesus surrendered his rights. Would we respond in the same way? Would we surrender our rights to the will of God? These are difficult questions. It is so important we remember that the heart of the kingdom is the heart of a servant. One has only to read the annals of church history and see the pages stained with the blood of the martyrs to know that our civil rights are not as important to God as our humble servant attitude. How true are the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Where will you stand when your faith is challenged?